I'm Judy, and I'm from uh, Halifax in Canada, which is the first stop to the west of London in North America. Yeah. Um, and I'll t I live in the meditation center in Halifax, and I've been meditating for about 18 years. When I started to meditate, I had two young children, and I was a single mom. So time was kind of a big deal. Uh, in that there never seemed to be enough of it. So this topic, um, slowing down the speed of time, came about actually as a result of my relationship with time changing. So that's kind of the purpose of this talk, is to explore our relationship with time. So quick show of hands, how many of you had to rush here? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, and how many of you were here with ample time to settle in comfortably? <laughs> okay, <laughs> Okay. I feel like most of us are living in the consciousness of either being a victim of time, it's always on my back and I can't really seem to get away from it, or we're running after time. Or maybe there's another one, which is, uh, this is probably my category. I'm always on time. In fact, I'm usually early, but there's a bunch of rushing involved and stress. Anyone fit in that category? Yeah, okay. So we have issues with time. Is that fair to say? Yeah, okay. And um, do you feel that time's moving faster right now? Do you? Are any of you old enough to have watched a remake of a movie you loved before? Have you? All of you. Okay, great. So mine was Parent Trap. I don't know if you have it here, but in North America it's very popular. Uh, and did you notice when you watched the earlier version how slow it moved? Did you find yourself getting bored? No. You must really love that movie. Okay. <laughs> So um, even in my lifetime, and I'm 55 at this point, uh, I have noticed that things have speeded up a lot, you know? And forget the 1800s, you know, forget the time period of this house where everything moved, you know, slowly and royally, just in our, our, our lifetime. So I'm wondering, uh, what is time anyways? I'm going to have a relationship with this thing, or I'm constantly, it's omnipresent in my life. And I don't know if any of you have thought about this. I'm not a physicist, and I don't know really much about Einstein's theory of relativity. But my understanding in essence, and if anyone here is, please come to the table afterwards and correct me, okay? But my understanding is that um, time is essentially the distance or the gap, the space, between actions kind of a working definition of time, right? So it would make perfect sense that we have so little of it. Why? Because we're moving, there's so many actions. We're all involved in so many things that there's no space between. Right? This is the theory of relativity as I understand it. Yeah? Time is relative. It changes according to our experience, right? So therefore, when I'm bored, and nothing seems to be happening, time moves very slowly, doesn't it? And yet when I'm absorbed in something that I find fascinating, like all neurons are firing, I'm engaged, I'm involved, time goes by like that, right? You've ever concentrated on a wonderful, oh, I don't know, knitting or creative endeavor, and you realize you've been sitting there for four hours, how did that happen, right? And time went by so quickly. You didn't notice. So in other words, time is relative, and therefore it is a matter of consciousness. This is why meditating becomes very important to heal our relationship with time. It's all a matter of perception, how fast or how slow time is moving. So that's the basic premise of this talk, is that we could actually slow down the speed of time depending on our state of consciousness. What do you think? Sound good? Yeah? You in? <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm going to tell you two stories. One is my practical experimenting as a single mom with this idea, because it's a big idea, but does it really work? Okay? 
So that's the second story. The first story, though, is I'd like to paint a picture of a metaphor that I have found really useful uh, when I think about time. And it, the metaphor is the river. And the story is that of um, whitewater canoeing. Now, you may know, anyone been to Canada? Show of hands. Nobody? Just a couple of you. And anybody a whitewater canoeist? Nobody. Yeah, me neither, but I spent a lot of my life in a whitewater canoe because I married an outward bound instructor. And he loves, I admit loved, I am no longer married to this wonderful person, but he loved taking us to the outdoors, which I loved also, but on high adventure experiences. So one of those high adventure experiences is whitewater canoeing. So I don't know what your rivers are like here in the UK, but in Canada they're raging. They're torrential. They come down from the mountains. And there are uh, five classes of rivers that you're allowed to paddle as a human being in an open boat, which is a canoe. It's not closed like a kayak. So five levels. And the third level, and let me see, the five levels is um, quite a bit less, the fifth level, less than Niagara Falls, but you wouldn't want to do it, OK? So we would typically canoe a level three. As you can imagine, roaring waters, the sound is booming. Um, you can't really hear the person at the back of the boat. I'm always at the front, the first one to die, right? Because the one who knows how to paddle has to be at the back, because that's where you control the boat, right? So raging sound, rivers crashing, water crashing against rocks, big rocks right in front of you, narrow passageways. You know, water's up to about here, Right when it crashes, and the passageway is quite narrow. You get the you get the picture here. Yeah. Okay. And I'm in the front because the person in the front has mm, little to do except say there's a rock. And of course, it's so loud that the person in the back has to have seen that rock themselves <laughs> because um, they wouldn't know. So um, this is a scenario where I learned about my relationship with time. So I would sit at the front, he would sit at the back, we would paddle in that sweet meandering way until we could hear the roar of water ahead, we knew it was coming, and then we would see something, and he would, just as the volume increased on the water and I couldn't hear anything except my heart in my ears, pounding like crazy, my panic and anxiety reaction happening, and somehow from the back of the boat I would catch, back paddle! And this would be the instruction that I was being yelled at. And this meant I had to paddle backwards as fast and as hard as I could, which wasn't a problem because I was willing to do anything to survive. So paddling back really, really fast, he would paddle back and we would hover above the river. It is the most amazing feeling. It's probably the only reason, other than love, that I got back in that canoe every time, is that when you're just hovering over the water, you can see there's a cliff right there. And any minute now, we're going over this because we want to. We chose to be here. But somehow, in that moment, we're not going anywhere. We are sitting because he's stronger than I am, and he's at the back. So that's really important. And I'm scared to death, so I'm pretty strong, thanks to adrenaline, and I'm at the front. So the two of us together have stopped this boat. The river underneath us is carrying us to our imminent death, at least in my mind. And I know, because I've been briefed on this, that once the river hits the rock, it's something like 20,000 tons of water. I'm exaggerating a lot of tons of water against a rock. The last place you want to be as a person or a canoe is between the water and the rock. And we've seen on our journey evidence of people being in this position before, which looks like a canoe wrapped around a rock. So if the person's there, yeah, so you know why I was afraid. OK, so this picture is racing in my mind. I know exactly graphically what it would look like and feel like to die in this river. But I'm back paddling really, really fast. And we're sitting still. And then he, the wise one, decides where the boat's going to go. Because what you look for is a V in the river. And it's where the white rolling waves come together in a tiny V. That's our aim, that's our destination. We have to get the bow of the boat, the little point where I sit, through that V and we will be safe. Right? We'll be on the other side of the rock, we'll be alive. 
in my mind. So, of course, we're always arriving at this rock facing the rock because that's where the water's going. You get the picture, right? Anyone else scared? <laughs> Just me. <laughs> I find this terrifying. Even reliving this is terrifying. Okay. So anyways, back paddle. So the boat's hovering there. And then he yells, which I can barely hear, another instruction, which will be either draw or push. I think that's it. Yeah. So draw means I have to pull the boat or the water towards the boat or the boat towards my paddle, which moves the bow of the boat ever so slightly like this, or I have to draw, no, that's draw, push. I have to put the paddle beneath the boat, oh, pry, sorry, it's called pry, I forget already, and I have to push the boat away from the water, which pushes it that way. You get the idea, right? So that's all I have to do is one of these two things, and once I've done that, then I get another loud instruction that says, paddle! And of course he's yelling, which scares me to death, but he has to because I won't hear him otherwise. In that moment, we both paddle with all of our force and shoo, we go straight through the V and out the other side. This is the exhilaration of whitewater canoeing. So you can never have to do it. You've lived it here. <laughs> uh, so what's interesting about that though is that the secret to whitewater canoeing is when I learned about a new relationship with time, which is you're very safe and you're very much in total control of yourself in the boat when you are doing one of two things in relation to the river. The first thing is you have to go slower than the river. That's the time of maximum control. So we could sit there and back paddle for quite a while while we talked about our strategy, or I should say he thought about our strategy, and I waited for the instruction, right? But we could sit there and just hover, and this water is raging beneath us, right? And then for a split second, we go really fast and we catch the V. So if you're going faster or slower, you're fine. If you go the same speed as the river, you go into the rock. Does that make sense? Isn't that cool? So, it became very obvious to me that the river is time. And I've got two options here. I either try and go faster than the river of time, which is what I usually do, right? I'm running ahead to keep ahead, right? I'm running after time. I'm trying to fit in all those activities in a limited time span, right? That's going faster than the river. And I'm rarely, unless I'm meditating, and I'm being very conscious while I'm walking, I rarely go slower. But that's actually my time of maximum leverage, my maximum power time, is when I slow myself down. Time's moving as fast as it's moving around me, but when I move slower, things happen differently. Get the idea? You get the metaphor? Faster than or slower than? You choose. I think most of us are trying to go faster than the river. But my experience in the whitewater canoe is that you go fast only for a split second, right? Because it's not sustainable to go that fast all the time, right? It is quite sustainable when two people are paddling against the river to sit there for an extended period. Get the idea? Okay, so that was, that's my metaphor for time, is that it's a river and I can choose faster or slower. Uh, slower is more enjoyable, actually. So the next thing I want to tell you is my practical application. And I think our time evaporates. This great slow time down, everyone. So my story is, five minutes. Um, uh, so I get this big, big idea as an early meditator, and I have these two little kids, and I'm a single mom, and I'm working, and I need to be at work at 9 o'clock, and the kids need to be at school at 8.40, and of course, two little girls, and the littlest one is, um, you know, given to me in this life to make me patient. So we have this child who, to this day, is just a gem, and I adore. And, um, and her name is Lucy, and she has red hair. So every morning at 8.30, which is exactly 10 minutes, it takes us seven minutes to walk to school, at 8.30, she has a complete meltdown, and the meltdown involves, I need a new stuffed animal, the outfit I'm not wearing is not right for today, I don't like what's in my lunch, oh, and I forgot that thing I can't find in my room. So all of these things have to happen in three minutes if we're going to get out the door in time for the bell at school. Anyone else know this scenario? 
Yeah, lots of us know this scenario. Okay, so you know what that looks like. And you know as a parent, um, one of your strategies is to manhandle, child handle, the child out the door. Like fierce control, seemingly kind and loving. Do you know that story? Yeah. Okay, so and then all the way to school, the relationship is a little bit like this because, it, you know, the tension was felt. So I learned this big idea about time. I can slow time down. They're small, these little girls, so they believe anything their mom tells them. So I say, don't worry, Lou, we have oodles of time. And I sit myself down on the couch in the living room and I do everything I can to employ my new meditation techniques. I am a peaceful soul. I am peace. And I know it can't be fake, because if, if it's fake, she'll be on to me, right? So it's very honest, and I master myself, and I get in the zone. I'm very peaceful. Don't worry, Lou, we have oodles of time. Get on a new outfit. Find that stuffed animal that you love, because I know he's really important to you to take Ellie and not the other one, OK? And I'll go make you a sandwich as soon as you're ready. I can't believe I'm saying this. So anyways, I decided to try this for 10 days. This is my new strategy, to slow down time. And I would say to her, don't worry, we have oodles of time, and you can slow time down. And we'll make more time so you can do all those things. So what do you think happened? 10 days, I decided to do, be scientific about it, you know, not just spiritual, scientific about it, and I clocked it every day to see what was our time differential getting out the door. So in the past, we would leave, what did I say? It's like 8.40, it's so long ago now. We had to be there, let's say for 8.40. We had to get out the door at 8.40, that's right. Seven minute walk, I can't remember. Anyways, all I know is we were always late. The bell had rung, the children were going into the school, we'd come rushing to the end of the line. So the new theory was, let's see for 10 days what would happen if I tried this new method. So of course what happened is she got calm, right? She calmed down. Her mother was in a stress case, so she got quiet. She looked quietly for our animal, somehow found it. I don't know how. Anyways, for 10 days I did this, and we got out the door. At the first day, about the same time. The second day, in the end, we achieved a five minute early departure time, consistent for five days in a row. Now that's, what do they call that in science? That's valid, that's, what do they call that? Significant, significant, yeah, findings, results. So anyways, um, what I discovered also is, is that when we walked to school, the relationship was lovely because we were both very calm. So to this day, I'm very grateful to that child for teaching me the lesson and to the ex-husband who taught me how to whitewater canoe. I think our time is up. <laughs>